Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here in Hearts of Iron 4 using the TNO submod Tsar and Soviets. Uh, I'm your host, Mr. Alexander Kazembeck Lever, but we gotta talk about war planning. At the main HQ of the army, there are perhaps a hundred different topographical maps, most of which are of sufficient quality to plan the forthcoming campaign. Almost all, among all these maps were the examples of both the West Russian War and the Great Patriotic War. There are also newer maps of various states in the territory of Western Russia. Among them, the now defunct Aryan Brotherhood, Berezniki's original extent, and even the West Russian Revolutionary Front. A less detailed map existed of Western Russia as a whole, along with the territory of Yatka. Vladimir Gill is a very capable military specialist that even Tukhachevsky, one of the most powerful marshals in the entire Soviet Union, drew influence from during the West Russian War. From town to town, this map would consult the maps, looking at important cities, towns, villages, as well as supply lines, mountains, hills, forests, and anything else that lay atop or in between. With the movement of his eyes, he charted a path for the men to follow. Gil was examining a map of Yatka and collecting a report on the combat readiness of the troops when Sergei Belozarsky entered the office. Oh, have you already received Kazembeck's orders? Belozarsky asked to surprise Gil. What orders? Gil replied curiously. It's orders to prepare for an attack against Vyatka, Belozarsky answered. I'm not sure whether an immediate attack against Vyatka would be wise, said Gil in response. I was just looking at the map of our territory, and it's clear that attacking, from, attacking them it was a far longer front than supply chain that a current conflict or a conflict against the Aryans did. Well, what would you do, propose we do about that then? <clears throat> Uh, if we really come into a war with Vyaka, we need to use the distance between our border and capital to our advantage. 450 kilometers is a long way, and it'll take time for our forces to cover the terrain while exposing our, themselves to attack. The most important thing we can do before uh, is begin our march to the capital is to secure Izyevsk, the main center for the weapons production. I suppose Vladimir knows perfectly well that without his most important weapons production centers, he can't defeat us. Precisely, and therefore we can surmise that he'll have concentrated his forces in the area. It'll also provide us with the opportunity to strike secondary targets, as it's likely that he'll place enormous emphasis on Izyevsk alone. Don't forget that Vladimir will also need to defend the main highway between Vyaka and Perm, but you'll have to make a choice. Try to defend everything at once, try to defend the highway, or to defend Izhevsk. Whatever he chooses will have the initiative, since no matter what choice he makes, he'll face problems from our concentrated strike by defending Izhevsk. He leaves the way open to Vyatka. By defending the highway, he leaves the way open to Izhevsk. And by distributing his forces, he leaves them open to heavy losses and the eventual fall of both. Sergei nodded. Don't forget, however, that there's a third option. A protracted war, in which case it would be better if we did not suffer major losses in the initial strike. Even in the first two cases you described, we run the risk of being hit in the rear by his troops when they realize that they have been flanked. What do you suggest we do about that? Repl replied Vladimir. We'll have to try to hold back the enemy by fighting until our troops who have pulled ahead have fulfilled their objectives. That sounds good from a strategic perspective, but in the case that we need to be in combat with them almost constantly, which could greatly undermine our military power and exhaust the men. That would be grueling and frankly absolute crap for the men, but the fact is that we have no other choice. Go regard the plans closely, either way. Our plans seem good enough for us to be able to use our initiative to the fullest. So long as we preserve that initiative, we'll be able to defeat Vyaka. It took more than a week to develop the plan further. Ultimately, the plan found approval from the rest of the military hierarchy, and the operation came to be known as the New Revolution. Begin the New Revolution, we'll crush the false Tsar. Now, we can't do well here. Well, we'll do some console commands. Yeah. Like normal. Pretty much like normal. Um, in the meantime, you guys go here. Try to encircle that group if you can. If not, I mean, you're fighting over River, which is... No, stop it. Just because it's on go-crazy mode doesn't mean you should attack. You know? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Stalker wins there. Aggressive variant. Oh, crap. That's not good. Well, oh, well. Okay, we're winning down there at the very least. We have no manpower either, but we're still coring the other states that we conquered last time, which is a pretty good thing. Some comments, though. Um, let's do agricultural methods first. Why not? Because we can. Choose the people Tsar because it's clear incarnation of Daddy Huey Long. And I did ask you guys yesterday whether we should do the Queen and the Regent, the Tsar General, versus the people Tsar. So there's a lot of comments about that. Uh, someone says you can play as the Belarusians in the Austin Civil War. Yes. Oh, yes. At the time of recording, yes, yes, we will. Someone else asks, who must go? Um, and someone else says, who must go? Who must go? Who must go? Um, someone else says, I wanted to say that this was translated from Russian or made by Russians, pretty much. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Very good. I love attacking. Oh, we actually were defeated. That's not good. No, you ding-dongs, go right there. Get these guys in place, even if for just a small amount of time. Yeah, overall. We're not going to have the divisions to really hold out here too much. One, two, three to do that. Um, honestly, you're about to get encircled, so... Stop there. No, you ding-dong. Ah, uh, you go there. You go there. Alright, at the very least, do not die there. That's like the most important thing right now. Force it. Come on, don't lose it, don't lose it, don't lose it. That's fine, they want to force the defense, that's fine. Okay, woo! Because they do have quite a few divisions, let's be real. They do have quite a few divisions, which is unfortunate. You guys hold. 
You guys keep going in. Alright. Not bad. We'd have to wait and get, like, cores on this group. Because it's kind of ridiculous that we don't have cores yet. Come on, six days. We get way more manpower. How are you losing all that? What? They overran our division. Yeah, I'm sorry, but Bianca is still way too strong for us. Yeah, we'll have to use Kahn's commands, unfortunately. I don't want to use Kahn's commands, but it looks like we are forced to. And there we have it. Totally, totally, totally fairly took out Vyatka. <clears throat> Old acquaintances first, though. We've crushed Vyatka, the stronghold of the liar of uh, Vladimir III. We'll see the Russian people on a path of misery and death. We'll have our former overlord defeated. We are in a position to do whatever we wish with him. Nothing's ever simple when it comes to dealing with the effing Romanovs. Despite the relentless Soviet propaganda of Bukharin's time, the family name somehow remains popular and strong. Vladimir's death would do little to please the public, but nor can we simply leave him in peace. He has far too much influence to be a constant, or to be content as a private citizen. Thankfully, Cousin Beck has a solution. And then, uh, changing color. Our war turned out to be not just a war to overthrow Vladimir III, but also a war to competing military strategies. Our homegrown generals fought with the generals of Vyaka, and despite our hard-fought victory, it's clear that they are very experienced in the understanding of military affairs. Such personnel should not be wasted, and we must recruit them for our service. Yes, they are most likely accomplices of Vladimir's foul schemes, and at one time helped them to achieve power by killing Russian people for self-serving goals in the just world. They should be condemned to die like animals, just as we dispense with Wagner and his henchmen. But they have a chance to atone for their guilt. <clears throat> Old friends, Kazimbek was on his way to the personal residence of Vladimir III, located not far from Vyaka proper. He was alone in the car, sat for the chauffeur who knew how to get to the residence. As he watched the scenery go by, he looked back on his own memories of the man. Former friends, they came together to fight in, the West Russian, in Western Russia, before parting ways on ideological lines. While the schism was regrettable, it was clear that any delay in pressing the advantage against Vyaka would likely have led to Vladimir launching an attack of his own. After a few hours on the road, the car pulled up at Vladimir's residence. The place had not been damaged during hostility since few people could even reach it. There was not a guard or nor indeed any person at all in sight since Vladimir had already been taken under the house arrest of Kazimbek's orders. Having equated himself with an empty mansion, he gave the order to have Vladimir brought back from his confinement. And all due haste, Vladimir was bundled into a vehicle and over. Uh, after exchanging a series of unusual pleasant greetings, Kazimbek was sure to remind Vladimir of the regrettable circumstances under which they were meeting. He beckoned Vladimir up to a second floor dining room, passing the portraits of several Roman Tsars, among them Alexander III and Nicholas II. There was a large table in the center of the hall, upon which many opulent and decadent banquets were no doubt hosted. <clears throat> Two men sat down at the table, which surfaced so neatly decorated with table linens, and finery as though a great meal was about to be served. It cannot be said that the former ruler of Vyaka was a poor man. Vladimir asked politely for something to eat, having apparently been dissatisfied with the rations he was provided in custody. Kazimbek, out of pragmatism as much as respect, ordered his people to prepare a suitable lunch. With lunch out of the way, Kazimbek shared his vision of the future with Vladimir. Vladimir, I should tell you now that we have certain plans for your daughter, Maria Romanova. What kind of plans should I be worried? Vladimir replied cautiously. We have considered her as a potential ruler for the new Russian state. As it happens, I myself will not be able to rule much longer due to the political ramifications of the so-called foreigner governing Russia. And after the whole mess in Western Russia has finally been resolved, I wanted to be considered among the applicants for the Russian throne. The applicants of Vladimir Thron frowned. So it might turn out that she doesn't rule Russia after all? <coughs> Precisely. After the end of the troubles, we intend to hold a Zemsky Sabor, and only then will you will select from the possible candidates, one of whom will be her daughter. If the council votes for her, then she'll become the queen. If she becomes a queen, then until she becomes an adult and independent, I will be a regent. And what if she isn't chosen? Then she'll be sent back to you, her father, so that you can educate her and raise her as you wish. We will not ask anything more of her, nor of you. What do you plan to do with me, though? Kazimbek grimaced. As I said, Vladimir, I plan to do nothing. I politely suggest you think twice about engaging in any further political activity, though. I could return your servants, your residence, and your last of titles and nobility, but in return you would never you would vow to never emerge in the public sphere again. You be Vladimir the nobleman, who hosts guests, hold parties, and patronizes charitable causes, but you must never interfere in the politics of the country. Vladimir paused to consider Kazimbek's words and nodded meekly. I'm sad that it's turned all this way, but I'm grateful for a second chance. I hope I, I hope and, I will hope and pray for the success of your new government. His business concluded. Kazimbek made his way back to Berezniki to continue his next phase of war planning. Whilst Vladimir relaxed in his arm, Chair and the first days of a new, more peaceful life. This undeserved mercy was necessary for the future of Russia. I'm going to integrate them. As you can tell, we were all over here. Because that, that whole part was a little difficult to get. Strategic space. Our military leadership was able to crush and scatter all the militant leaders of Russia bordering on Berezniki. We're also able to diplomatic a diplomatically annex the military monastic order of Gany, which was our northern neighbor. We destroyed Wagner's pseudo aryan threat from the south and saved thousands of Russian people from slavery and death. Most importantly, we were able to defeat the liar Vladimir III, who gave the lives of the Russian people for what little power he enjoyed in Vyakka. Successes of the young Russians are visible and obvious to anyone outside of Berezniki, with our borders now enlarged far beyond its original extent. The young Russian dream of a people's monarchy in Russia is being raised, or realized right before our eyes, and many are still trying to understand the greatness of this moment, but there are still opponents of our ideal around us, in the north. The nominally democratic Komi, the remnants of the West Russian Revolutionary Front, and the West lies of Vologda, clinging fanatically to the farcical notion of neutrality while the dogs of Tatarstan and Bashkiria, later the south, are trying to hide themselves from view as they eke out a meager existence like scavenging Mongols and hiding in the woods. Further beyond them, the KONR controlled territory around Samara, no doubt plotting and scheming further to undermine itself and motherland. 
We're actually starting to revive, but for now our leadership must continue to advance the cause in small steps, and we must therefore drop a new plan of action. Why did, why did the devs make this extremely long? Every single one of these has become extremely long. It's kind of getting annoying, I'll be honest. It's a bit too much for, in my personal taste. I know it's TNO, but my, my god. And they're trying to tell the story, but Jesus. A uh, letter of conscience. Kazembeck turned his gaze at Bashkiria, where Ahmed Zaki rules. A petty governor who came to power after the collapse of the front. Ahmed Zaki, according to Kazembeck, is an intelligent, wise, and strong minded person. He fought for his people with all the strength he could muster, because he was tired of seeing how the officials of both the USSR and the Russian Empire treated them. No doubt he'd be extremely interested in Kazembeck's plan. Changing the color. After the end of the war, there are many generals in prison who are on the side of Vladimir III. Many of these generals are diehard ideological supporters of the defeat of Yakin Kaz, and they have served their fallen Tsar since the time of the West Russian War. Fearing the stigma of collaborators as such. Despite the fact that they are enemies of the Russian people, having sided with the Germans, they are nevertheless good military specialists who showed worthy resistance to troops during hostilities. This suggests that their moral failings could be selectively ignored on pragmatic grounds. It would, of course, still be enjoyable to line them all up against the wall and see that their brains were blown out. But such an active macabre theater would not confer any long term benefit for the motherland. We must once again show mercy. The army of Berezniki is still lacking significantly in senior officers due to the very limited recruitment pool we began with. So, to ensure that our army avoids descending into anarchy, we should recruit at least some of these generals in our service. Belzerski instructed his subordinates to bring the generals a proposal to take the march of the military oath of Berezniki and the young Russian party and commence a new military service immediately in exchange for general amnesty. <clears throat> the proposal was warmly received by all the generals, but nevertheless, they proved reluctant to take the oath to Kazembek himself and the hubris. They insisted, insisted that the Maladros were treated as the legitimate Russian monarchy. Some of the ranks insisted that by fighting alongside them in the war against the Revolutionary Front, we were too were serving the Tsar and turning away from them. We betrayed him, the Russia itself. Whereas some named former friends in our ranks in the same breath, they did not some as traitors and scum. Then of course they brought up the Nazis. They said that whatever misfortune befalls the Russian these days, he can always find a way to tie it back to the effing Nazis. Well, the hint of irony or sarcasm. A disheveled looking officer argued that when faced with the Red Plague, it is a moral duty to take up arms against it, even if it comes at the price of fighting alongside a long-term enemy. After the aforementioned officer received several fists to the face and a hard kick to the groin, it dawned on the men that letting such morally bankrupt officers into the wall would be dangerous, yet alone putting them in uh, command of military units. Yet the entire ideological staff there were two people who agreed to swear the oath regardless. Evgeny Yuardorovich Messiner, an ideological anti-communist, uh, agreed to take the oath under the pretext of fighting the communists. He argued that to do so was preferable to languishing in prison and seeing the motherland divided permanently between the various warlords. He received a great deal of overlap between his ideals and ours, and though he was somewhat tact tactless in how he asked for specific answers about our ideology, on the other hand, Grigory Prokipyevich uh, Zaganev completely agreed to our terms without almost any words to the oath of allegiance of Kazan Beck and the people bears Nikki, a truly iconic officer. A week later, they solemnly took their oaths of allegiance, changed the color of their uniforms, and entered the service of Madarosi, Russia. While some people raised serious concerns about their loyalty to the new regime, we must treat them according to the principle of trust but verify. We shall sign them new shadows in the form of secret service agents who will carefully gather any and all information about their activities. Their lives will thereafter be judged not only what they can do in plain sight, but what they can do behind our backs. They choose or chose their own destiny. Strategic space. Success on all fronts was inspired by the leadership of Berezniki. The military order has been attached almost without problems. The Aryan Hydra was finally slain and we overthrew the liar of Vladimir III. These successes show that our carefully laid plans were well advised and the efforts of our brave men and women are not in vain. Already we can appreciate the new kind of order that we've been able to provide for our admiral, admittedly, very small territory in Russia. That isn't to say that we should rest on our laurels, the war for Western Russia is far from over and our enemies still surround us, from the north, west, and south. The approach of borders and this suppressing expectation of another attack is even more worrying than before, we must plan, 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 plan. Kazembek, Belzerski, Gil, and the rest of the generals that gathered in the main office of the Berezniki administration. Kazembek talked about the prevailing military situation in the region and listed the towns and strategic points along the new border. Attention was that such that every man considered his words carefully, for given poor military counsel could bring disaster down on Berezniki in a matter of weeks. As a proverbial David between the two rows of Goliaths, the KLNR and WRF, it was clear that they had to make a very carefully con considered calculation regarding who to attack first. Having put this question to the generals, Kazembek received a steady stream of proposals. One man argued that it would be preferable to consolidate the possessions of the weaker warlords first before fighting the larger toe. Gel and Belozerski, on the other hand, proposed to strike south in one great push, capturing all the territory on the way to Samara. This initiative was supported by Zaginov, but opposed by Messiner, who argued that it might instead be necessary to align with the KLNR temporarily to defeat the WRF. They argued that it would be better to have one ally and one enemy than fight a two-front war. As much as he plans, or his plan, for temporary alliance seems sensible. The ideological case for attacking the KONR seemed to outweigh the pragmatic case against it, and few other generals could stomach the idea of fighting alongside Vlasov's men. Vlasov is, okay, after all, betrayed the motherland and its darkest tower, and could easily do the same again, stabbing us in the back of the most inopportune moment to seize the initiative and take Russia for themselves. Furthermore, if we were to even sit in the same room as one of them, it would seem as if we had chosen to sign a pact with Satan himself, although to make such a comparison would probably be unfair on the devil, or to the devil. 
Kazenbeck will be as ever guided by his own political and moral compass, and as it happened, his institution co coincided with the military consensus. A decision was therefore made the military would march south and destroy the fascists and traitors of the there before taking up the fight in the north. The battle for Russia has escalated. Now, these are auto capitulated or auto completed. So, if you want to read about Capture Kazan, please go ahead, as well as the Armored Jewel of the West. Autonomy of Faith. Um, well. I guess we can't really do too much else then. Um, we still raid, maybe. We could use more command power, though, for that. We don't have a lot of growth. Still a lot of deficit, which doesn't make any sense, because the military hasn't not expanded that, by that much, has it? So we have another division, but still. More RT? Yes, please. Um, letter of Consciousness. And therefore, I believe that we must start an invasion of Bashkiria without delay. Uh, there's no need to exchange effing love letters with them. General Val Valavov spoke with mocking tones. The general staff. Oh. <laughs> Together with Kazimbek, discuss their actions in relation to the state of Bashkiria. Adashev and Volkov, keen to minimize losses, already argued for equipping pro-Russian elements of Bashkiria with weapons and equipment to displace the incumbent government and replace it with a pro-annexation one. Uh, meanwhile, Vavilov and Volkov have been frequently interjecting, having come to the firm belief that any plan for peaceful annexation was a folly, and the quick dash of UFO was necessary to prevent any physical resistance by separatists. The discussion had drawn out for several hours and punctuated by several colorful insults from both sides did not make their way into the official transcript yet, and yet, Kazimbek was silent throughout, suspiciously so. Once the Jones finally cooled their tempers, Kazimbek got up and began his reflections. After listening to you, I had an ambivalent opinion on this interesting situation. Either a coup spending precious military equipment, which in many cases our armies simply cannot spare, or an invasion which would no doubt cost lives that need to not be thrown away. I propose a compromise between our two positions. Kazanbek took a neatly sealed envelope from his jacket. A letter conscious. Soon I'll send it directly to Bashkiria for the attention of Ahmed Zaki Validi himself. I'll offer him peaceful accession to Bashkiria to Berzniki as well as a very good autonomy within the near Russia, with amnesty for the entire government. If they refuse, I will of course be a cause for sadness. I am not, however, prepared to pause while each warlord in our path deathers and delays in the face of our seasonable demands, and the choose to resist, we will of course attack swiftly. The entire government will see the inside, see the inside of a jail cell, while Bashkiria will get its autonomy under properly vetted loyalists. What do you say, generals? Ardeshev listened attentively to Cousin Beck, and when he finished his long speech, he asked, so are we sending them an ultimatum? That's right, Ardeshev, a very firmly worded one. The generals were signed. It was clear that everyone agreed. Let's hope they choose the right path. Autonomy of faith. Bashkiria has joined us. This is monumentous. Uh, Van has granted us another photo on the turbulent region of Russia. But the Bashkirs are not already uh, accustomed to the new regime. They believe that it will be a nationalistic and chauvinistic as the USSR, the Russian Empire. We must therefore give them autonomy as well as giving them as much freedom without the borders of the countries they wish. Kazimbek sat in his office and looked out at the window. It was raining, and Kazimbek did not like rain. The rain brought with it a flood of depressing thoughts. Will the young Russian ideal prevail? Will unify... Will he unify Russia according to his vision? Many bleak thoughts visited his head and quickly departed as quickly as droplets fell from the overcast sky on the sodden gro ground below. His sullen trance was thrown to up there by the calls of an assistant bursting into the room. Zaki agreed. He says he's coming to person to Berzniki and wants to negotiate the autonomy settlement in person. Come runs Cousin Beck. Well, well, the letter of your consciousness actually worked. Cousin Beck smiled. I'll be glad to talk to him in person. Nice move. German puppets. Samara is currently the most hated fragment of Western Russia, unlike everyone else, who continued cooperation with the Germans, even when it became clear that the Germans had betrayed the collaborators. The last I probably won't give up without a fight to the better end, but we must surely end this madness. It's time to destroy the traitors once and for all and excite some malignant tumor from Russia's southwestern flank. To do so, surely help us clear our for our next for clear us uh, for our past cooperation with the Germans. Uh, life under the Russian boot. Oh, you have motorized, but you're only eight combo with I'm not interested. Yeah, that's really gonna explode uh, the debt, but whatever. Mansour's uh, held a service every day at the Asian Mosque. He was a highly respected man and a great responsibility to his community. He was also a close friend of Akhmat Zaki himself, but now everything was different. Berzniki had formally annexed Bashkortostan. The Imam was afraid he even started the service. The Russian soldiers simply blocked the passage for ordinary faithful Muslims, the Imam thought. The soldiers just stood in the streets, looked at people, even talked to them, and treated them like ordinary people. No fights, no shots, everything was calm. Perhaps even everything he remembered and feared about Russian oppression was really an artifact of the past. Ufa had become even more beautiful than ever. Now Mansour could return to his mosque to conduct a service for his Bashkir brothers in peace. Peace and order. We'll see for how long, because we actually have enough equipment. Look at that. Wow. Artillery wise, how are we doing? 1400 is pretty good. I'm not going to lie. Well, as much as I want to do that, we have to invade, so. Now we should be fine. The Tribunal of Samara. Out of the fall of the KONR, a large swath of territory has fallen into our hands, and with it, a large number of prisoners. These people are guilty of many crimes against Russia, now it's time to punish them to the fullest extent of the law. 
Let's save our command bar for this stuff down here. So we integrated more, but we still don't have. A... So you're telling me the combined populations are better as Niki, Vyatka, and these guys over here is not enough. They're in Brotherhood. I don't believe you. I really don't believe you, game. Or mod. There we go, see? I wonder where that where manpower was gonna go come from. Keep going, keep going. You're doing great. Bennett, I love Bennett. A lot of people don't like Bennett. Sergei, level 5 aggression. Or attack. Far not too bad. Oh, well, military police would not be bad either to get. We only have so many research slots, you know. Did we actually make it an encirclement? No, we did not. Not really. Because I'm already on those things. Help them out. Because that would be great. There you go. That's very good, very good. What the heck do they have on the division? Jesus Christ. Must be 44 combo or something. Just in case we go into that, throw on a ton of artillery. With some coffee, of course. Hmm, I wonder if we can make any planes yet. Maybe we can. We have a whole one plane. Do we have more production units? That's nice. Oh, wow. Well. Find him, just beat him up. Good place to defend. Very good place, actually. I'll be lost more losses than they have. Good. Slowly but surely, we will fully push in and destroy them all. Hmm. Not bad. <clears throat> and better Artie's good too. Next level Artie be grandiose.
Let them leave. We'll attack here and take that and destroy these divisions up north first. As long as no one else wants to kill us off, of course. And I want to take this tile too. That wouldn't necessarily be bad. Very up here, and then we can help support the attack here too. Forces we can probably improve too, which would be good. Let's go down there. Hey, not bad. Just don't lose. Of course, it's much easier said than done, though. Nice. Exactly what we wanted. No attack here next, or you guys go here. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Samara's a flipping huge nation. They're huge. Huh. Cut them off. Good. I'm glad we do, we do have horses, though. That's really nice. Good, good, good. Oh, come on, man. Nice, not bad so far. Remember that, please go ahead. Nice. Level seven attack is not bad too. You were doing the, the whole sneaky work your way around this whole place idea. Well, a lot of deficit. Now it's going to lag very hard. Oh man, the game was about to crash right there. My bad. My apologies. And they, he won. How much more manpower does this group have? They should have literally none. Jesus Christ. How do you have so many divisions? It's 
Man, I don't regret using Khan's commands at this point, because the AI is just cheats. Like, holy crap. They cheat hard. I was going to I knew that for a while, but still. If you can't win there, don't do it. Just defend for now. You will not destroy that division. You will die here. My god. Yeah, I don't regret using Khan's command still. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous how overpowered some of these warlords are. Yeah, there goes Dietzlin. Okay, so that's good so far. No. More soft attack, please. Yes, sir. Good. Come on. No, go in. I'm not telling you to stop, son. Good, thank God. No one gives a crap about the Indonesian War, man. We lost, what, 50,000? About, roughly so. Friend victory in Africa. So be it, so be it. How the hell is, can we not do anything here? Everyone hold. You guys consolidate your stuff. This is ridiculous. These guys have way too much strength compared to us. I mean, at this point, like, they shouldn't really contest us that much. This makes literally no sense. How? How? That's not over a river. There's no river. Maybe it's over here. That's it. I mean, come on. Force it. For the love of God, just force the attack at this point. Ah, they do have air superiority. I see. That's how come we keep losing. Stupid things like that. Because they somehow have an industry still to support that. I don't understand. Yeah, we're not going to be able to get anything done. You losers. Over here. Actually, come over here, maybe. Shoot up a little bit. A little bit. Not by much, though. Come on, come on. 
Ridiculous. It should not need to take that long to capitulate Samara. New managers. After a brutal suppression of the Republic of Tartar stand, huge nationalist rallies of the Tartars packed the streets of Kazan. To calm them down, we need to organize a stronger police presence. Such men will need to be properly organized, lest they give the impression of the mere bandits and robbers roaming the city. Tartars and the sympathizers refuse to work for us. Leaving the territory in complete anarchy. This needs to be fixed. Are we see instantly 50,000 more manpower? Wow. Stupid. Incredibly stupid. Uh, now we're going to do this without any divisions, basically. I don't think I can really recommend this unless you release consequences. Trying to play fairly sucks. It just sucks in TNL. Oh, the tank brigades. We'll soon reap the rewards of our victory over Gorky. The tanks that we took during the war have already been integrated into the new tank division, which distinguishes our army from the infantry formations of our enemies. There remains many more warehouses that have yet to be secured for equipment. Perhaps we can find more useful material there, which will probably carry our young Russian banner all across the motherland. Dude, re really? I mean, I know it's TNL. I'm sorry that I'm being really ragey about this, but it's just like, come on. Come on. Every single one of these is super long. I kind of want to see what happens with like just the economy and stuff, but today to understand lives in ruins, people are fleeing in mass to escape the hunger and the war. Uh, who's to blame? One can point the finger at Kazan Beck when initiated the hostilities, but the history is written by the winners. Here in Berezniki, they will try the true culprit beyond the apocalyptic war, Abdullah Alish. Wait, no? Wait, what? Kazan Beck was personally present, present at the trial. The general sat next to him in the front row, and the judge presided from the front in a cage of the side was Abdullah Alish. Almost entirely bound in chains. He had noticed he lost weight and was a shadow of the man he once was. Kazan Beck felt the power of his triumph over him. It remained only wait to the decision of the judges. Abdullah Alish, your sentence to death for your collaboration and for your actions that led to the war between Berezniki and Tatarstan. It was you who holds ultimate responsibility for the deaths of both the Russian and Tatar, Tatar peoples. How can anyone honest or any honest man call you the hero of Tatarstan? You are permitted to take, make a final statement before your sentence is carried out. Which doesn't make any sense since we didn't even do this, but we didn't even take him out. Alexander Lipovich Kazanbek, you are blind, you are deaf. I defended Tatarstan from your ambitions. I defended Tatarstan from the occupation regime. All I saw was a peaceful sky over the Holy Land. You still understand, and yet you, you yourself were born in Kazan. I wholly say that you have commanded your men to loot and defile. Do you seriously think that with my death the Tatar people will submit? They know the truth, the truth that you have de tried desperately to hide from the others. Or remember my words. Kazanbek looked at him all the while, then quickly whispered in the ear of one of his generals, finish this off quickly on board. After his poorly received speech, Abdullah was dragged outside of the bloodstained wall. Vlavlov was more than pleased to throw him against it. Soldiers, get ready. A soldier was ready the rifles and aimed at the man who had already resigned himself to his fate. Shots were heard. The body rolled down the wall and fell into its own fresh pool of blood. The collaborator allowed his last breath as the soul left for another world. There, then there was silence. New managers. <clears throat> Ivan Andreevich is a minor official in Berezniki who does equally minor paperwork. He hated his job, a small salary, and duties so boring that they often sent him to sleep at his desk. He thought his banal existence would last forever, duh, but one day a letter came to him that unexpectedly promoted him to a regional office, official. What joyous news, he thought, were not for the fact that such a promotion sent him to the lost land of Tatarstan. The needed experienced officials to restore the territory from the devastation of the war he had read, and yet he could not help but wonder how he could possibly make his home there. Amidst an alien culture and faith, this was of course an order, not a request, so it was in no place to refuse. A very generous salary was also a plus. Ivan came to Kazan with his family. <clears throat> the city was indeed in ruins, but Russian soldiers, together with the Tatar people, rebuilt the city. Unfortunately, that was not enough. All the newly arrived officials had to come into the former government building, which had now been downgraded to housing a simple city council. Uh, arriving there, he noticed showcasing traces of bullets, dirt, and various bits of debris. There were obviously fierce battles going on here just weeks prior. From the, from there, he entered the majestic office, which was covered with what looked like gold, where people like him were already sitting at a round table. Kazan Beck himself stood before them. Glory to Alexander Livovich, the re great regent. Everyone shouted, and Kazan Beck would be back in everyone's seat. He began to speak. Comrades, Kazan lies in ruins. The Tartars resist our rule. They consider us invaders, but we are not. We brought justice back. Tartars and Russians should live together in peace and harmony, for unity only makes us stronger. You are the people who shall form the foundations of a new Tartar stand. You're, you are the people whom I, both I and the tar entire Tartar people look at with hope. We will treat the Tartars as their brothers will not touch their faith, their traditions, or their culture. They should not be afraid of us, and we should come to us to see us as friends. You all have great responsibility in your shores, and hopefully that you will not let me down, or the Tartar people. Yes, glory to Alexander Libovich. Everyone shouted with even greater enthusiasm. Let's go to work. The Tribunal of Samara. Out there to fear the chaos and our, a large swath of territory has fallen into our hands, and with it a large number of prisoners. These people are guilty of many crimes against Russia, and now it's time to punish them to the fullest extent of the law. Man. I mean, I don't, I don't mind like, quite a bit of reading, but... You know, I know it's TNO, but come on. Gorky's gold. All the participants in the 2nd Rifle Division were awarded medals, and many were promoted. <clears throat> Go kill yourself. You stupid WRF. Wow, they're looking really weak, which is good. Uh, medals of many were promoted. Alexei Dobrovnarov was the luckiest among his comrades. He was appointed the new division commander. As a former leader, he had been killed in action. Now his division was ordered to search several warehouses where, presumably, there could be, could be more equipment. The more equipment they could find, the greater the advantage Berezniki would have over its future opponents. 
Uh, <clears throat> Alexei himself understood this simple fact. He spared no time regrouping his men and headed to the first warehouses. The first warehouse was located south, of the city of Gorky, about 10 kilometers from the city, near the village of Kalachevo. The villagers themselves did not suspect that there was a strategically important facility right under their noses in the forest. They finally made it through the woods and found themselves in some near, near some kind of dugout but without a warehouse in sight. Alexei went to the dugout's door and rubbed it a little. A metallic sheen soon appeared. It was still a warehouse. Alexei ordered his men to find a passage to look through the contents of the warehouses. They found the passage, but it was locked, forcing them to use dynamite as sparingly as possible to avoid damaging what lay inside. Some dynamite was cruelly piled up by the entrance. Get down, Alexei shouted to his soldiers, who hid behind the trees just in time to avoid the unexpectedly loud explosion that resulted. A large hole had appeared in the wall through the which everyone soon entered. The warehouse had wide conventional weapons, armored personnel carriers, and some tanks, of course. The hastily arranged explosive dealt some damage to nearby equipment, but had little effect on the vehicles par parked further within. Alexei asked for a line of, uh, to the general staff. He was handed a phone and began to speak. The equipment has been found and will be sent to Bereznik immediately. The military will continue to come to the warehouses in search of any additional equipment there. Fantastic. Well, we did all right. Oh my god, the general's last day. What? Vlasov walked around. Slowly, surrounded by a squad of Mladerosi soldiers, he understood perfectly where he was going and what would soon happen to him. The details of his impending fate were explained to him quite clearly at first. At the trial, five minutes, only one twentieth of an hour was exactly how long it took to pass judgment on the traitor general. A special case had been made for him. Others had to pass through a much larger bureaucratic heck to receive their sentence of death, of course. The leader of the ROA could only blame himself for what had happened. He betrayed his homeland and he led the people who followed him into the open gates of heck. There was no forgiveness for him for the man of God. <clears throat> There's something unusual about the sky today. The sun was shining brightly and not a single cloud to be seen. Not even a strong wind could shake the crowns of the trees. Uh, why should a man being walked to his death uh, seek to contemplate the weather? It seems as though the whole world had frozen, as though nature itself had composed with bated breath the watch as uh, justice was dealt out. Velasco found himself standing at the wall, partly refusing to offer a cigarette. He also preferred to stand with his eyes closed. Even then, he was not devoid of simple human fear. At the moment, the general had only one last thought on his mind. I hope it's over quickly. I hope my people can absolve themselves of the guilt. This makes more sense. Let's do this one. Calm in the south. Our victorious army was able to secure the south from endless strife and unite the region under control. The inhabitants of these regions have welcomed us with open arms, supposedly, and sees the real heirs of the USSR and the Russian Empire, which they honestly don't. Today, a meeting will be held with the country's ministers, who will prepare to report on the country's budget on the state of the army and on the ideological education of the people. Trouble in the north. We are able to free southwest Russia from bad and chaos and strife, but this is only a small part of Russia, and it's only half of its territory this side of the Urals. Our only small section lives happily and with hope for a bright future. Well, what are the lands of our north? The North must also be liberated. Russia must be liberated. The South is just the beginning of our army, and the North is not the end either. I'm sorry that I'm speaking so fast, but if they want to have so much reading, kind of expect it. You know, you kind of do it to yourself if you expect this much reading. Of course, with these divisions, they are 27 convoys by ourselves. Kazimbek left the building of the Regency Council, where he once discussed plans to conquer the Bashirs and Tartars. Now he had an appointment in Samara, where many ministers and high-ranking officials from all over the country were scheduled to arrive with reports on the state of Berezniki. Kazimbek was not particularly <clears throat> uh, fond of this process, but because he felt obligated to listen to much, uh, much monotonous reports in an excruciating entirety. The content was already the same, percentages unemployment. The uh, poverty rate. A platitude about being our economy and calls for some measures of regulation, so it went out. It seemed the Pence pushers were prone to forgetting that Kazimbek was a man, not a robot. But work was work. This is not just a job, but a debt to Mother Russia. Kazimbek got into his black convertible, was very stuffy in the car, so he took off his coat and left it on the seat beside him. The car started and headed for Samara. Do we really know that he needs to take off his coat? Several so hours passed, maybe six or was it eight. Kazimbek did not count, for he had managed to fall asleep on the way. Soon his driver woke him up. We're entering Samara now. Wake up, Alexander Livovich. Why are they shouting, huh? I'm, I'm away, gosh darn it. Kazimbek sat sleepily, rubbing his eyes. It was already daylight, and people were staring at the car as Kazimbek waved out of the window. They soon arrived at the magnificent theater where the meeting would be held. Kazimbek got out of the car and was greeted with a storm of applause. Entering the building itself, he was greeted by his fellow party members, generals, businessmen, of whom there were very few, and some ordinary local officials. The generals and Kazimbek were given a place on the only balcony from where he could see everyone from above. The meeting commenced soon after. For the first hour, Kazimbek tried to carefully absorb all the information, occasionally writing something in his notebook. However, time passed and Kazimbek began to nod off. The general, sympathizing with his tired state, put a pillow beneath his head, sometimes waking him up so that he could add remarks that were better delivered by him personally. Everybody needs some rest sometimes. This is another problem with these very long texts. I mean, you have to mangle it to get to here. Let's split it up into two. Um, uh, the meeting lasted ten hours. Holy crap. The room was very stuffy, so everyone raced for the exit when they finally announced that the meeting was over. All the council back remained, who, having woken up, uh, asked the Jones the broad strokes of what re re was revealed by the reports. Everyone gave the same view. The economy was stabilizing. Volunteers were signing up to the army. The popularity of the Mladerosa were growing every day. <clears throat> Praise the region. That being said, many generals stress that the problems such as unemployment, poverty, poor education, illegal trade, and violations of workers' rights remain. They could at least say that the southwest Russia was now fully integrated in the Berezniki. Glory to the regent. 
How what am I gonna get up here? My god. Come on, man. I know we have to do amnesty, but come on. A radical republic. Rescuing the drowning men. Recruitment. Oh well I can't do that one, so I guess radical this one? Tempting offer. Radical Republic, I guess. We have secured our borders, but the radicals are coming out threaten us from the north. The what the heck? The flimsy structures of the liberal democracy finally given collapse. The radicals and visionaries are carved up and the republic and transformed it into an authoritarian state of their own. Bears Nikki stands a little chance of persuading them to abandon their beliefs or form an alliance with them, and our statesmen widely accept that an invasion will be necessary. The Jones will meet with Kazenbeck to discuss a plan of attack. Well, we'll see about that. Well, we can get a little more war support. And command power. Preparations. Kazenbeck shifts sifted through the various pieces of framework. Also, you wondered about this one with his head. He contemplated taking a break to have some African coffee. He was all too aware that it had been made by the slaves in a German Reich's commissariat. They had paid with their blood and maybe with their lives so that this strong and beautiful coffee could be on his table. As the thought scattered the wind as the door to his office swung open. <clears throat> Alexander Livovich, we need your guidance, said Valavov and the company of the other generals. Kazanbek was not happy at the sudden arrival of the generals and hoped that they had not come in to raise a trifling matter with them. Why have you come? We originally analyze the campaigns of our army to the south, and so that when we turn our eyes to the north, we will have to refine our tactics further, proudly proclaim Ardashev. Well, why does that matter to me? It's a military matter, first and foremost. You know that I wanted to get some rest. Kazanbek shouted angrily before taking a pause to think, okay, what is it you want from me specifically? We would like some extra money to be allocated to the budget for basic training. Many soldiers will only learn how to hold a rifle on the battlefield in absolute disgrace. <clears> hmm. <throat> Kazimuk considered the request. Money was tight, but men did indeed need some kind of training. He once examined the troops and was very disappointed. He could therefore find no reason to refuse the request of the generals. I hope the money will be used responsibly. Of course, Alexander Livovich. The generals left his office, leaving Kazimuk to finally enjoy his coffee north. Oh. Okay. Oh, what? What? Well, okay then. Rescue the joining men. After the fall of Komi, the former republic is now under the complete control of Berzniki. Nevertheless, the radicals of Mason and Komi has left the region restless and difficult to control. Rallies of protests still grip the towns, and petty challenges to our authority take place at every moment. Despite his own reservations, Kazan Becker resolved to release our former democratic officials who survived the killings and purges after the fall of their liberal order. They know that the people of Komi and their experience is required to finally secure control over the region. Surprised we don't have any uh, supply issues, but you know what, whatever. Oh yeah, she have a deficit. Look at that. A green deficit, huh? Let's go attack. Nice. Did we win or lose? They immediately went to war with them. Are you kidding me? That's so stupid. Uh, we just can't do well, can we? Man, this focus tree, it's not bad. It just needs a little bit more work. It really does. I hate having, why do we have to wait? Let's just go to war. Seriously. Excellent, well, this, that's good. Close the border. Vlog has been annexed to our state, but we must now contend with the problems that Ivanov could not solve. Criminal trade routes passed through the coast drama, with business coming from the German-controlled regions of Muscovy buying raw materials for their factories at low cost, and shipping such materials out of our territories in defiance of the law. We do not know exactly who buys and who sells, but we must stop this robbery of our lands by collaboration with businessmen. We'll close the borders with the German Reichs Commissariat and end this clandestine trade link. This is sure to anger them, though. Well, everyone, at this point, I mean, there's nothing we can do. Bears Niki, this nation is so god-awful, um, that, uh, well, it is what it is. I mean, I, I have to use cons commands at this point, like, for everything. And it's terrible. I hate doing this. I hate, 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 hate having these accounts, man. But you have to do it because this mod is... Uh, it's, it can use some work. It can absolutely use a lot of work. But regardless, uh, Rescue the Drowning Men, of course. Um, if you're going to need that again, please go right ahead. But yeah, this is this is not fun. It just is not fun. I'm sorry. Um, I if you enjoy the video, that's great. I do I hope you do enjoy it. But it's just... It's not been great for me, at least. Because just... The amount of frustration this nation has, even though these guys are not bad, I'm trying to fight up here is god awful. And in general, is in general, but brothers and spirit enemies by circumstance. Having subdued all the warlords, upstarts, and militant generals, all of whom were weaker than us, we find ourselves face to face with the West Russian Revolutionary Front. 
The WRF, which sat at one time almost won its war against the Nazis, even now poses a serious threat to us. The military potential, just like Alts, is capable of uniting all of Western Russia under its own banner. Yet all the opponents they could have faced, now they only face us. It's quite obvious that they will soon attempt to attack us, and we must therefore present them. We must prepare for war immediately. Also, for some reason, for God, some god-awful reason, this just never fired. The the uh, WRF, I tabbed over to see what was going on, because I thought they might go to war with us. No, I tabbed over, and they were glitched. They couldn't do anything. Why do you have so much poverty rate change? What the heck? I guess we I did do a uh, negative real growth, because I did, uh, what was it, enact war taxes? Whatever. Um, but yeah, it didn't make sense. They were glitched. They couldn't go to war with us, so I had to force them to go to war with us. So, yeah, not great. Amnesty. The front has fallen. The last obstacle to our domination of Western Russia has vanished from the map. It's worth noting that they have many talented commanders who have shown their combat experience in battles against, against us and the Nazis during the West Russian War. Even though they remain our nominal enemies from within their own prison cells, it would be better and wise to consider them potential recruits and impress as many of them as possible to the service of the Laterosi. Yeah, I would never do that. Never, ever, 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 ever do that with the WRF. One cell, though. <clears throat> Sergei Karel Yusupov, along with ten soldiers, was ordered to search a government prison located far away from civilization. Karel did not like nature. Why was it necessary to build a prison this far out of the wilderness? Orders were orders, anyways, as the soldiers clambered in the truck. <clears throat> they drove for about an hour to the location of the prison. The weather was cool and the breeze flew in Karel's face through the open window. The sun was just out of sight before the tree line, casting ominous shadows along the ground. The foreboding view of the building ahead unnerved Karel a little, but it did not let it show as he arrived at the building. They were surprised to see no man guarding the prison and the entrance wide open. It stands reason that they had fled days before. Come on now, move your butts, we don't have much time. The prisoners, for the most part, remained crammed inside the prison, and the soldiers went cell to cell, releasing any prisoner not explicitly listed as a political detainee. As instructed, they were offered any political prisoner of the region's choice. Join them, let here or die. This was the order from the top, there was no question in Kazanbeck. That, of course, let, off, let some open room for personal persuasion on Karel's part. If he was able to get a senior lead to ch leader to choose, and choose life and join the young Russians, he would surely be promoted. Man, that's... <clears throat> One last cell remained. One last cell remained. What do you mean one last cell remained? Too many gunshots for Karel's like, and the region would be displeased if too few, too few officials were returned with them today. Perhaps cage animals were prone to making foolish choices when faced with barrel of a gun. The sentry hit them first as they peered into the cell. The emaciated corpse that was within, his flesh in a fairly advanced state of decay, was flanked by two ghouly figures who proved difficult to identify first. While no doubt alive, they looked painfully thin, were covered in filth from head to toe, and as it turned out, they were Costigan and Selena. The corpse had a hole in its head. The corpse. The hole had been seemingly made but some time ago because magazines had made their side their home inside. The skin was almost completely decayed now, the eyes had rolled out of their sockets and onto the wooden floor. Karel could tell, if not by stop by inference, that this was the corpse of Vosnesinski. He quickly excused himself from the cell and vomited against a corridor wall. The ghastly broken pair of his companions were gently escorted from their pit of nightmare and provided with some much needed medical assistance. Fifteen minutes passed. Karel had ordered his men to carry the dead from the cells and make some attempt to burn them in the forest so as to not leave such a mess. It didn't matter they were to never return here, no man should witness such a grisly scene here again. Carol was now standing in the makeshift medical room with Kosygin, waiting as he was treated. He already had freed Stalina, he knew that she would refuse, and he was not the sort of sick, sick F who would kill a defenseless woman. Kosygin was still shaking a little as the medic handed him a sequence of pills to take, for he seemed consumed only by the heck that he had experienced. Carol broke the silence, Cameron Kosygin, I'd be very pleased if he joined the Mladerosi. Many of your colleagues have done the same, and many of your talents could serve the people well once again. <laughs> Karel broke the silence, of course. Kostigin uh, understood the dynamics of this offer. He had heard of the gunshots. He knew the brutality of man. He knew that he could serve, or he would soon find his body hollowed out by maggots, as his dearly departed friend did. Yes, that's how I'll join the letter else. Kostigin whispered faintly. Now about that promotion? Well, let's see if we fail here. If you have anything, you want to attack him in reverse, too. Well, 27 combo, but this doesn't seem to be doing that great. I mean, it does okay. But, oh, they pay tribute. Okay, well, whatever. Uh, Red October, never more. A few weeks have passed since the victory of the Komi Bolsheviks. Now an honest judgment can be rendered for the final sins. Our judges have yet to fully pacify the communist uh, ad adjutants. Still engaging in petty acts of vandalism and assault on the streets of the Siktikar, we've been able to transport the ringleaders of Berezniki for trial. Boris Pomonaromev, uh, Andrei Zidanov, and Svetlana Bukharina. Each occupied a different faction within the communist party, but they all share a couple of ability and go for their actions against Russia and against a social order. <clears throat> Kazabek personally attended the trial to give his personal advice to the judges before the start of the trial. Many present already knew what awaited them. The well rehearsed practice of trying the state's enemies soon began. Those began a detailed description of the life of the convicts and the influence of the Communist Party. Comey, soon the judge who had hitherto listened attentively to the presentation without taking notes or loud interruption, looked over the three convicts and began a speech. Today, these defendants have come to answer the serious charges pressed against them. We now already announce our verdict against these henchmen of the communists. The first verdict is with regard to this black horse of the party, namely Boris Nikolaevich Polmanarov. Uh, Polnomara. The judge turned to the old man who coughed a little for your wretched political activities of tyranny, promotion of anarchy, and treason to the motherland. You were sentenced to capital punishment, death. The witness gallery began to talk frantically between them. 
Pull no more. That was a broken shell of a man reduced to a mere shadow of himself by his captivity, and the punishment seemed unexpectedly severe. It was customary to spare at least one defendant in the group trials such as these, so that this to demonstrate the region's balanced capacity for mercy. And most of the expected Pomomorov to be the defendant to spare the firing squad. Our next combat is Andrei Alexandrovich as Zadonov, the judge said, turning to Zadonov as Pomomorov was drafted from the room. For his political activities and participation in death or in terror against the Russian people, he should be sentenced to death. Zadonov bowed his head down in resignation, full expecting the guards to pull him from his seat and drag him to the firing squad at any moment. However, because of the scientific work and illness, the court finds him or finds mitigating circumstances that spare him to the death penalty than this case. Instead, I sentenced the defendant to 20 years in prison. Zadonov looked at about, about him in shock, while unholy prepared. Holy unprepared for the sudden reprieve. Svetlana Nikolaevina Bukharina said the judge, locking eyes with the defendant who glared back at him, You're merely shut of your father. You have a felt his legacy of a failure or an embarrassment to the Russian people. I would have him shot if he were here today, but not punish you for his far greater sins. This court sentences you to 10 years imprisonment with hard labor for your political activities and your participation in the war against the legitimate Russian government. The trial's now over. The remaining convicts were escorted from the room to their fates. Whilst just outside, a truck started to take Oponomara up to the special place where the region saw fit to send traitors to their maker. Kazimbek was pleased. Bukhara might have died in an ignominious death over two decades ago, but his true death, the death of his legacy, came to the last dismissal. Prophets of the Bolshevik faith were cast down by the righteous hand of the Mladerosi. The red tide broke against the rocks. I apologize for all this reading. I mean, I really do. Like, I'm, I'm used to reading a lot, but like, everything, every flippin' focus has a focus, and not every focus needs a... Need, needs more reading. It really doesn't. Um, now we're forced to go over here. The long march is over. Our campaign against militant journals and radical ideologues has ended with the triumph of the Mladerosi ideal. There's Niki united all the territories of Western Russia beyond the AA line, cementing itself as a sole legitimate successor to the West Russian Revolutionary Front at the height of the power of a decade ago. Our victory shows the value of our wise leadership and the heroism of our youths, and the major steps we've taken to the orderly and united Russia show the righteousness of our cause for all to see. Now that the European part of Russia is unified, we must consider the future of the state. Although the territory is whole again, the government is still effectively a ramshackle clique of Kazan back a party men who solely unsuited to govern such a large region in peacetime. Moving day. Uh, after the destruction wrought by the militant generals, we have a serious problem identifying an administrative center sufficiently damaged to serve the government hub of Mladerosi, Western Russia. The old capital of Beresniki is but a small provincial town and does not meet the new realities of our expansive state. It is likewise. <clears throat> important to select a capital that sufficiently proceeds for an enlarged country. The question of having a suitable capital will be especially important if we want to hold elections at the throne through the Zemsky Sabor. The election should be held in a suitable venue and should be located in an area that is more accessible to delegates traveling from distant parts of the country. Besides, having a good capital will ease our everyday administrative problems too. Amnesty. We cannot ever hide from the sad fact that during the West Russian War, we the young Russians took up arms against the front to help Vladimir III to gain power in Central Russia. <clears throat> And in the course of the conflict, we face many competent commanders who display bravery and valor far beyond what we'd encountered before. Such personnel are a very valuable resource for Russia. Just as we did in Vyaka, we must attract such generals to our side, lest our towns be wasted. Belozersky sent letters to the internment camps and prisons where senior front officials have been detained, sitting out to stand a proposal for each general to pledge loyalty to the Mladerosi. Many of them, as it was to be expected, refused to break faith in their defeated cause or pledge loyalty to the great enemy, Kazimbek. It amuses us asked to ask why they made such a foolish decision. Many said they did not like the idea of a tsar in any form, making colorful marks by the Romanovs and the tyranny, whereas others pointed to the damage wrought to the motherland by extremists and contrasted it to alleged stability under Bukharin. Even though we brought Vyaka to its knees and tore the last Romanov from his throne, they still could not believe in the justice and providence of our cause. Belozersky reported his findings to Kazimbek. The region who had found himself in merciful mood that morning decided to announce an amnesty for the generals, commanded the soldiers of the Revolutionary Front in exchange for the cessation of any insurgent activity against Berezniki. They get out for a peaceful life or serve the motherland once more in the armed forces, but in no case should they ever take arms against us, against us again. In such a case, there would be no more mercy. The region made that very clear. Alexander Livovich insisted that such an act of forgiveness was the highest tribute he could offer to the respected enemy, even where the enemy can be made a friend. I do apologize for being so raging in this video. It's just, the, the pacing is... It's just off. It's completely off, in my opinion. I could be very wrong, though. But my apologies for, once again, just being very raging. But if you enjoyed the video somehow, please do consider leaving a like. It helps me out. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow, as hopefully I won't be as ragey. And uh, we have gotten rid of our debt. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.